our next uh, final uh, hearing is on the recent TNC ordinance. I'll invite co-author Robin Wansley to, stay few, to say a few words about uh, the ordinance, and thank you for being here and being patient. Thank you, Chair Osman. Um, so, colleagues, today we are considering amendments to the business licensing requirements for the transportation network companies. Um, I'm going to share a brief overview of what these provisions do and why my co-authors uh, co and I have brought them forward uh, today. So the first one is related to fair transparency. So this amendment will require uh, that in order to be eligible for a license, a TNC must send a receipt to both the rider and the driver within 24 hours after a trip. And that receipt uh, will include the amount that the rider paid, the amount that the driver received, the number of miles and minutes in the ride, the per minute and per mile rates, or any variable or surcharge uh, pricing that impacts the cost of the ride, as well as the amount paid to the driver. It also requires that the TNC provide each driver a weekly summary of their time worked, miles driven, and an accounting of how the total compensation for the week is calculated. Um, fair transparency, as we heard throughout our conversations around um, our ride share protection policy, um, is, is simply crucial for riders and drivers to be able to know that TNCs are in compliance with the city's minimum uh, compensation requirements. Drivers also need to know how their pay is calculated on a ride-by-ride -ride basis, as well as on a weekly basis. Um, and these are provisions uh, that other workers uh, can sometimes forget that, you know, without them, there's literally no accounting of, you know, what a company pays them, why they're being paid a certain amount for a ride. Um, I think also in this space, we have heard throughout uh, several public hearings that, you know, many drivers um, who have completed a long ride um, have been compensated uh, incredibly low amounts and oftentimes without any explanation or accounting of how that compensation related to the ride itself and why it was the amount that it was. So by amending the ordinance to include fair transparency, uh, drivers can essentially become their own advocates and take action to correct or resolve any discrepancies in their compensation. Uh, fair transparency is also importantly a consumer protection issue. Uh, currently Uber and Lyft can charge a rider $50, uh, give the driver $15 of it, and walk away with the rest. And the rider has no idea what the driver is getting and might assume, which we've often heard, um, assume that the driver is getting majority of what they pay for that ride. Um, and this can also impact uh, their ability to receive tips as drivers. So fair transparency should both uh, be disclosed to drivers and riders, and the secrecy around it has essentially resulted in uh, unfair uh, workplace uh, practice, essentially, in conditions uh, for drivers across the nation. Um, and we know the ride share industry in Minneapolis is going to be more diverse than just the current two uh, companies. And fair transparency allows riders to have more information about how different companies handle prices, uh, driver compensation, and therefore make informed decision about which company they would like to use. Um, the second amendment is for data disclosure. Uh, this mandates that any TNC regularly disclose closes bulk data to the city. This is incredibly important for labor standards enforcement and identifying if there are patterns of wage theft or some minimum uh, compensation. It's also crucial for identifying um, if there are patterns of discrimination. Uh, for example, I know I've heard that, you know, there's concerns around if uh, certain neighborhoods are not receiving the same level of services as other neighborhoods. So having access to this data can be able uh, could help us be able to discern if that's actually a credible pattern. Um, this data will also allow our public works department to be able to make informed decisions about street design and traffic management. Um, lastly, we will need data disclosure in order to comply with the requirement um, that was passed in the, the last ordinance uh, to continuously evaluate the minimum compensation rates in the ordinance, in the overall ordinance in itself. Uh, fair transparency and 
enforcement mechanisms were also both recommendations uh, made in the governor's task force report that was uh, co-created by both uh, TNCs, including Uber and Lyft, drivers, uh, state lawmakers, and a number of other stakeholders, such as riders. Um, these are essentially common sense provisions that can ensure that the ordinance can be both uh, enforced and evaluated. In addition to these two amendments, I know this will be taken up, but I want to express support for the amendment that has been submitted by Council Member Chowdhury as well as uh, Chair Osmond uh, that adjusts our per mile compensation rates from $1.40 per mile to $1.27 per mile. Um, this rate reflects uh, agreement that um, is a byproduct of conversations with our state leaders um, that will extend minimum wage equivalents to uh, more than 10,000 drivers across the state. Um, so I'm very excited about this. I know my co-authors and I have been willing to work with the state and a number of our colleagues to land um, at this place of agreement and especially agreement that reflects um, alignment between the city and our uh, state's legislative bodies. Um, so I'm excited that we're here to do everything that we can to protect um, our workers, also doing so while making sure we're not stripped of our local control as well. So I support this amendment and look forward, uh, hopefully, to its passage. But that is basically the summary for the two uh, amendments or and or provisions that's in front of you today. Thank you so much, Councilmember Robin Wansley, for uh, the explanation. Um, now, uh, I'm going to proceed the public hearing and call. I have one person here, Steve Wright. Good afternoon. I just wanted to come by and introduce myself. My name is Steve Wright. I'm the CEO and founder of Rides. We got our permit approved uh, last week. Thank you, Amy. Um, anyway, uh, we're here and we're ready to actually onboard drivers. Uh, we're ready to, um, to abide by all the amendments. In fact, most of what uh, Ms. Wansley just spoke about, we already have. It's all front, up front in the app. Uh, passenger sees exactly what they're paying, miles, minutes, and everything, and they can say, what does my driver make? Uh, and that pops up in a window, and it says exactly what their driver is making on the same trip. We also give the same exact invoice to the passenger and the driver, so there's no smoke and mirrors. It shows everything the passenger paid, what the driver received, and what they didn't receive, like an airport fee or, uh, or uh, insurance fees. Um, so just mainly wanted to introduce myself and let you know that, uh, that we're here. We're on the ground. We're doing our first onboardings tomorrow. Uh, the first handful of drivers will be uh, officially on board tomorrow, and we should be live uh, probably by end of day tomorrow. We'll actually be ready to start taking trips. Thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you. All right. Now, I see no one else. I will close the public hearing. Um, are there others to speak? I think there isn't. <laughs> All right. Close the public hearing. Are there any discussion from council members? Councilmember Chowdhury. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Osman. I think uh, Councilmember Wansley did a really good job explaining the amendment before us. Uh, I just kind of wanted to um, highlight that, again, we came through the, came to this amendment through discussions between uh, me, Councilmember Wansley, Council Vice President Chugtai, with state legislators and leadership and authorship of the TNC bill at the state level to have a potential shared rate of 127 per mile. Uh, this rate is consistent with the policy and research addendum analysis that was presented to this committee on April 19th at our last meeting. The addendum analysis uh, considered the state's Dolly report and accounted for variable changes in gas and vehicle acquisition, all other va variables from license, registration fees, maintenance, cell phone, insurance, cleaning um, were constant and consistent with the state study, used the same numbers, and vehicle acquisition was utilized, utilized the same data uh, that the state did on registered vehicles at the Metropolitan Airport Commission. Um, 127 per mile is presented in the policy and research analysis. Uh, and we found it to be a middle ground rate that accounts for vehicle financing of drivers with uh, good credit at 48 months of financing. Our hope is that this rate is able to ensure the dri drivers who are most impacted by subminimum wage are paid a minimum wage in Minneapolis. It is also a rate that is between the metro area rate and the greater Minnesota rate uh, per mile in the state study. 
We believe that this amendment shows an eagerness to collaborate with the state legislators, provide fairly to drivers, and is a decent compromise at 13 cents decreasing from the rate that was currently set in our ordinance. The current ordinance also provides a mechanism um, that an, an external evaluation be conducted on the impact of this ordinance after six months and a year after its effective date on July 1st and every year after. The report will include compensation impacts on driver behavior, rideshare ride companies, passengers, and recommendations on improvements, providing us a mechanism to make adjustments as we see reasonable and necessary. I'll close by rooting us in the reality that we're facing. The drivers in our city and our region are being paid a subminimum wage by large corporations that rely on their work to be rely on drivers' work to be profitable. The drivers who provide most of the rides in our region are largely immigrants, black and male, and are overwhelmingly relying on public assistance and are living at or below the poverty line. We are currently a part of a national conversation about the fact that the system of rideshare that we currently have is exploitive, exploitative to its workers and are pitting people who are working class against each other from folks that rely on rides and the people who provide the service. We're not kicking out the two large rideshare companies. They're choosing to leave if they decide to, and they're choosing to leave residents and drivers behind. That is why I'm also really glad to see uh, one of the rideshare companies that um, is newly approved. I believe now there are two, and there are a couple others that are currently on their way to completion. And there's currently also an app-based taxi service that support rides currently active. Markets change and we must remain constant and steadfast in our commitment to workers as we have in our city's history. There's no incentive currently for the large corporations to uh, push for a rate that's not the lowest possible without threatening to leave and also provide, and they also have not been providing any information on economic in impacts to their profitability. So we must look at fact. Wage floors have been pay passed and ride, sh ride share services have continued in um, other cities such as New York and Seattle. Statewide policy has been passed in Washington alongside a municipal policy in Seattle with ride share service still continuing. Two large corporations will tell us that the wage floor will make it impossible for them to exist in this market but they continue to operate in other communities where the wage floor is much higher. So I'll just finish by saying I thank the drivers who have been advocating for these changes and that are struggling currently in our city to pay for food, for housing, support their family as a cost of living, um, and almost everything else that people rely on is rising. We need to see a fair minimum wage at its bare minimum for them. We cannot say that a, this is an essential service without saying that the drivers who make rideshare possible are essential workers. The rides to medical appointments, grocery stores, through bad weather, from the airport to downtown are only made possible bec because of the drivers who serve our community. And all companies who come into our city must comply with the minimum wage regulations and pay their workers fairly. I look forward to your support on this amendment, and I thank um, my co-author, Councilmember Osman, and I thank Councilmember Wansley for her work over the last two years on this ordinance, and I thank our partners at the state legislature and, of course, the community members and the riders who want to see a system that is fair and just and uh, something that upholds the standards for workers in the city of Minneapolis. Thank you, Councilmember Chowdhury. Before we go too far with that, um, I would first of all I'd like to make the motion for original ordinance uh, for approval. Can I have a second? Second. All right. Thank you. That motion second. Councilmember Chowdhury, do you want to make the motion to amend the ordinance? So moved. Second. Uh, all right. Uh, we have all copies on the motion. Uh, it's before us, and uh, now it's open for discussion. Councilmember uh, Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Osman. Um, a couple of comments. I guess I'm, I'm just curious, was there, I mean, you talked about negotiation. Were drivers and rideshare companies involved in these conversations at all? Um, 
I mean, it seems like there were three city council members and three state legislators who made this decision. Um, there are many other stakeholders uh, at play, and I'm just curious what is the input and or involvement of some of those stakeholders. Secondly, um, the rates, while it is less than our original rate that we passed, is still higher than the state's study. So I'm, I'm just concerned about the viability of the rate, uh, particularly, you know, the, the governor's um, needs to, to be able to sign off on this. Um, and so that, that is a concern, I guess. Um, you know, we talk about changing these things and we continue to use this word workers. And yes, they are workers and they deserve to be paid fair wages. But I think we are traveling down a path, and in Massachusetts, there's legislation or uh, legal actions taking place right now to determine whether or not these rideshare companies are, in fact, employers, and the drivers are employees. And so if we continue to do this, we're going to force this out of the quote, gig economy into a more um, traditional workplace. Um, so those are some of the concerns that, that, that I'm just um, expressing out loud. Uh, thank you so much, Councilmember Jenkins. Uh, for your first question, I would call Councilmember Wansley, who has been part of the process. And I think your question was about the process of discussion with the state. Yep. Thank you, Chair Osman. I'll also, uh, you know, ask that Councilmember Chowdhury um, chip in in any parts that I leave out as she's been um, our IGR chair rep um, and has been a crucial uh or played a crucial role in our negotiations. So just for the public record, um, I want to be very clear about the negotiations piece. So for several weeks, um, several council members, uh, that being the co-authors, council leadership and chair, uh, IGR chair, uh, council member Chowdhury, as well as state leaders, and we're talking about leadership in the House, as well as the Senate and the governor's office have met for several weeks to talk about where can we find alignment and agreement when it comes to compensation. So this whole thing about stakeholder, stakeholders not being in a room, that's simply not true. They have been a part of those conversations. Also, Uber and Lyft has been kept a breath throughout that entire process of us having these conversations about where we were landing, where we were thinking. Um, and no one should be surprised that Uber and Lyft are still holding firm to one. Actually, Uber is saying 68 cents per mile. So they're not even talking about even the DLI study itself. So we're at a place that one, Uber and Lyft did not elect us to deliver on policy. They are Silicon Valley tech company that has been exempted and allowed to be exempted from our minimum wage policy for several years. And we're simply as legislators closing the loophole. And when we were talking about working with state officials to pass policy, we work with the body that passed policy and that were the state leaders. They passed that information on to Uber and Lyft and they were kept abreast of what conversations we were having the entire time along with Governor Waltz. And eventually the legislative body of the state and the legislative body of the city said, as Councilmember Chowdhury highlighted, based off of the data that we have, both within the DLI study and our own um, respective study here that includes the part analysis, we landed at a dollar and twenty-seven cents per mile, which is reflective uh, from the data that is out there on ride shares. So that's some context about the stakeholder conversations and how we landed where we landed. Um, in terms of uh, traveling down a path of uh, somehow treating uh, ride share workers or gig economy um, workers as workers, I want to highlight there is nothing in our policy that deals with classification. 
that is where we would actually be dealing with matters around classification of worker status and whether or not people should get certain benefits as opposed to, you know, full time employees. So that is not something we're taking up. We are acknowledging a loophole that exists in our current minimum wage policy that has allowed drivers, uh, ride share drivers in particular, to be paid a some minimum wage for years that is backed up by the DLI study um, itself. So I hope that can provide some context, please. Council Member Chowdhury, um, fill in in any gaps that I missed. Council Member Chowdhury, before I call Council Member Rainville, if you would like to add any more. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair Osmond. Uh, I think I would just like to add that our goal in meeting with state legislators was honestly to see if there was a pathway for us to bring an amendment forward to the rest of the legislative body so we could have a discussion together about it. Um, we brought for there have been different rates that have been brought forward, some with no discussion with our state legislators, and this is one where I felt it was really important as an individual council member uh, to have those discussions to see what was possible. Um, many state legislators indicated that uh, a lot of their policy really wanted to. Um, be able to understand where the city of Minneapolis was headed as we are um, a large part of uh, the total amount of rides um, within the region and so uh, we had we had some really good faith conversations with the governor's office we had conversations with our state legislators I believe drivers at the Capitol uh, a group of them have been pushing for 130 per mile um, I've had conversations with uh, drivers as we've moved forward through this process and it, these conversations happened it really again just in reality to bring forward an amendment that was really rooted in a dialogue and um, state leaders wanted state leaders and the authors really wanted us to be able to have an agreement that we could bring forward and the part of the agreement was bringing this amendment forward for us to consider together as a legislative body uh, and I think Councilmember Wansley did a pretty good job of covering the rest. I will give it back to the chair. Thank you so much. Uh, Councilmember Rainville, do you have a comment or questions? Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do have a question. Just to be clear, uh, Uber and Lyft were not part of this. You told them what was decided. You didn't ask their opinion on the costs associated with this. Um, for clarification, are you saying this as a definitive statement, Councilmember Rainville, as if you were there, or this is something that you're hearing? No, you. you uh, let me repeat it so you you understand. Please, I'm asking the question. Mm -hmm. Was Uber and Lyft, uh, other than just you telling them what was going to happen, were they consulted? Were they asked how will these costs affect their business? Yes. So I believe I shared state legislators were in conversations with Uber and Lyft and throughout that process, as we were negotiating, they held firm to, at least on Uber, 68 cents, which they've talked about publicly, even as we've made it through passage in the House and the Senate. So they were consulted and they held firm, as they've been doing, on not wanting to adhere even to DLI rates. So they were consulted by the state, not by this, by anybody on our on our council. Councilmember Chowdhury, I think I have to add some answer. Thank for you, Councilmember Rainville. Um, so, in discussions with leaders at the state legislature, as we were moving towards a number, they were holding conversations with Uber and Lyft and uh, brought forward the rate to them. And as Councilmember Wansley stated. Uh, both rideshare companies held to the lowest rate possible, 68 cents for Uber and then 89 cents for Lyft. And as I stated in my remarks earlier, there is no incentive for these rideshare companies to go above anything be below that. There's no incentive for them to share whether they are profitable within these rates or not. Um, I believe that one of the members of the Senate Finance Committee asked yesterday or a couple days ago when the finance meeting happened to Uber directly, are you, are you profitable with this current rate? And the question was dodged and then it was asked again and then it was dodged. And then I also believe that Council President recently had a conversation um, with Lyft about this. Uh, 
about this raid and the person that he spoke to, I believe that person has also been emailing us, their public affairs person, I'm not remembering his name, said they're not authorized at the level that they are to uh, give an opinion on our number um, and that, that it's not at their pay grade to give anything, anything besides 89 cents. And so at a point, it is my opinion that policymakers have to make policy and move forward and what we have before us is a rate that is rooted in data and information. And again, within the ordinance that we're looking at with data transparency available, we'll be able to make adjustments as necessary if, uh, if the rate is not correct. And I think that that is a good direction to head in. That's a long answer. So are you telling me that uh, the state wants these amendments. So this is coming from the state legislatures to us? This is a byproduct as you received in your inbox a week ago, and that has been passed now through the House and the Senate, 127. The state will move theirs per mile to $1.27. The city will also do the same, which is why we're taking up this amendment. And the shared agreement is we would do that in tangent, and they will take preemption off the table. That's their agreement. Okay. Thank you for those answers. And uh, I'm not going to vote for this. I, I think that it's really important to have the companies involved directly. And uh, for us to get involved in that is, is just not what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to fix potholes and pick up the garbage and uh, have police services. So that's, that's what I'm going to be spending my time on. Thank you. All right, thank you. I would like to uh, <laughs> have my. Um, I would like to make a comment about this. First of all, thank you so much, council members, who have been tirelessly working last couple of years, meeting the drivers, uh, you know, doing all this study that we have done. This numbers coming, uh, coming from these numbers, and still going to the state. Even though we had no reason actually to, to even go back from uh, from 120, uh, 140 to 127, but still, you took the leadership uh, to meet the state legislators to to work with them because you want something done for the drivers. Uh, let me just remind the folks that we're here because what Uber and Lyft did to our drivers, because what we have seen the wage theft, the the, the cheap labor that Im this immigrants have been doing for many, many years. And finally, we have a legislators and, and, and a council members who have stood up for them and say no to these companies. You got to be any other company in city of Minneapolis that's operating. Follow the law we have in the books. We have done our duties. We have crunched the numbers. We came up a perfect number that the state legislature agree that we have agreed. It took a lot of work, a lot of veto, and a lot of discussion, but we are here. This is the perfect solution to move forward. Drivers being happy. Are we talking about is Uber and Lyft profitable? Really, is that the question we're asking? Let's just think about this. What does Uber and Lyft provide? Only app. Vehicles for drivers, gas for drivers, insurance for drivers, labor is for drivers. Everything else is for drivers. They're out there somewhere else in the world in a computer. They're not here in our community. The drivers are here working. Uber only provides app. That's it. They don't provide anything else. Nothing else. Any other business, there's expensives. You know, there's stuff they have to buy, there's, uh, there's uh, rents they have to pay, all that stuff. Uber doesn't do that. It's this, this new technology, and we ha our laws and policies have to keep up with the technology. And that is exactly where we, where we have been working for it. And I think where we are today, it, it's, it's, it's a great work, and, and it's a place that we can all agree. And I believe that uh, we will, uh, the adjustment we have made makes sense to the state. I'm actually speaking to the, the governor to sign that bill if it's passed through the state. Make sure these drivers and our city are protected 
for any other technology. Policies have to keep up with the time we're in. All right, uh, that is my comment. I would like to call Councilmember Cashman. Thank you, Chair Osman. Um, you know, I'm, I'm voting in support of this compensation rate change today. This is us upholding our end of the compromise agreement that we reached with the state legislature, which I thank my colleagues for delivering on. And although I wasn't in all of the negotiations, I personally spoke with the full contingency of House representatives and state senators who are representing Ward 7. And so this is a moment where we were able to collaborate and communicate what the passengers and drivers of our city need. And we have reached a compromise here that will move us forward. And I also want to acknowledge that through our work on this, we have expanded the market. There are two new companies now licensed and ready to provide this service to our city. And um, that's really good news. And that's a great outcome here too. So I'm happy to be supporting this um, amendment before us today. Thank you, Councilmember uh, Cashman. I will call Councilmember Palmasano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, if I may, I'm not on this committee, but I, I have a question, um, perhaps for the authors, and then some comments. If the state legislature is already passing or has already passed a rate of a dollar twenty-seven per mile, why is the city of Minneapolis passing the very same rate? Isn't it duplicative? Isn't that a double use of taxpayer money to monitor and adjudicate the same exact rate at the state level and then the city level? Hmm. Councilmember Allison. <clears throat> uh, I'll, I'll let the authors address that, but I do want to say it, it is, it's not uh, uncommon for us to have municipal laws that are in compliance with state laws or to match you know, state laws so that we can have our own mechanisms of, of enforcement. I feel, like, I feel like that's pretty normal. Um, it's something that we do on other you know, items as well, probably less contentious, so less recognizable, but it's, uh, that doesn't strike me as particularly out of order or, or uncommon for um, how we might handle um, ordinances. I appreciate that. Um, I do see it as a little bit strange in a dynamic pricing and kind of environment. Usually we would say we follow state law, right? And that state law might increase over time. Um, I doubt it would ever decrease over time. Um, but regardless, the thousands of messages we've all received from residents who are concerned about Uber and Lyft's departure from Minneapolis, um, they were not asking members of this body to meet with lawmakers at the state to figure out which rates would be agreeable to their political agendas of, of this session. They were asking us to meet with Uber and Lyft to keep those particular rideshare companies in Minneapolis. That didn't happen. Um, the rates that we have before us today, this 127 rate was determined by a handful of state lawmakers and only three of the 13 total members of this body. Um, these three council members don't have the authorization to go and speak on the city's behalf. Um, they might have been invited to do so, but when I learned of this, after the fact, that felt really backwards, and I have to name that. I was not told beforehand that these three council members we're having a meeting, that we were sending anybody to the state or who we would be meeting with to try to come up with one common rate. Um, I like the idea of having a common rate, but how did it come to be that these three council members were authorized to go and negotiate on the city's behalf? That seems incredibly outside your role here. I would feel it's outside of my role you don't speak for me, and how would you feel if I went to the state legislature and said I was there on behalf of the city making deals? Like that on its face feels absurd. Um, there's a falsehood here that the city came to an agreement. We're a governing body, all of us, and you're not authorized to go and negotiate in this way. So I feel there's a big problem here that goes beyond rideshare about democracy on the Minneapolis City Council. But also importantly, and something I have to name here, is there is tremendous opportunity cost to this session and how this specific initiative has taken the place of all of our documented approved legislative priorities. We haven't yet seen how this legislative session concludes. 
but we have significant needs as a city for things we all have agreed on, like red light cameras, funding for the Nicollet Bridge, stormwater tunnels, and several more pages that aren't having their due time this session because so much time and energy has been spent trying to untangle the mess created by this specific ordinance. And those are things we agreed upon as a body. It's really important to say that. As far as I can tell, you've waylaid our House and our Senate majority leaders to spend incredible amounts of time on this days. And I think there is a path forward here that ensures drivers are paid fairly and without disrupting these essential services for riders. I continue to support the rates that were informed by that study and acknowledge the different kinds of benefits that that wage study provides at different levels. And, and I think we could come to a true compromise, but it would have to be one that is agreeable to drivers and riders and TNC companies alike. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to come to your committee and say what I needed to say. Thank Chair you. Just, I, I, I do want to remind folks that uh, there's a meeting here, HPC, at 4.30 today. So uh, the best is to wrap it up. And we still have an item. And thank you, Arts, for being patient. Um, before I call you, Councilmember Wansley, I was wondering, Councilmember uh, Jenkins, if you had any comments, your thing are standing. Oh, I'm sorry. Can, mm -hmm. Keith, uh, <laughs> Whatever the order is. I just okay. Sorry, I, I thought you were uh, Thank you, Chair Osmond. In the, in the interest of time, I will cede my time. Councilmember Allison and then Councilmember Wansley. Um, thank you. I... You know, a lot to digest, a lot of comments. Mostly, I'm, I wanted to say, similar to Councilmember Cashman, I'm going to be supporting this. I think it's good um, for this to be brought forward, and I thank the, the authors as well uh, for bringing this forward. Um, and, you know, I'm kind of processing in real time some of the discussion that's been had here, and, you know, maybe. I'm open to my analysis being a little bit off here, but I think it's pretty normal for authors to have conversations, uh, authors of an ordinance to have conversations outside of like a full body, uh, you know, full enterprise agreement. Uh, you know, I've certainly have had stakeholder engagement for renter protections in the past. I've certainly have had to, uh, you know, have conversations about lawsuits around ordinances that I've worked on in the past. And it wasn't, from my from my recollection, uh, it wasn't this. It wasn't city council members who interjected themselves into state business. It was a year ago, a year plus uh, ago. Uh, the state uh, interjected itself into an ordinance that the county that the council was writing at the time, that the city was writing at the time, and it was the state who didn't move forward in 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 writing a law. Council members again started working on an ordinance again a year later, and then again it was the state who threatened to um, to interject and and uh, and say that they were going to to preempt. I'm using the state broadly here. I know that there's a lot of individuals, and not all of them, are, you know, were speaking in unison, nor has this council been. I think that it is, you know, it would have been a little bit odd to me if the authors hadn't been responsive to threats of preemption and gone and had conversations um, and uh, and I would not have anticipated I would have found it a little bit strange if the authors had come to me and say hey do you do we have your permission to represent the city hey, it's your ordinance it's your ordinance go 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 do what you need in order to uh, make sure that your ordinance can get passed and if I don't like it I will vote against it when it comes up on the dais that's what we have here Right? And so I don't think that, that, that anybody came up and said, hey, we represent the city. The authors went and they represented their ordinance and now their ordinance is before council. And so we get to vote for it or against it. And that's, that's my view of this policy. <laughs> is that laughable? No, uh, it's correct. Council member. It's not laughable, it's correct. And so if, if, there, if, if, if I'm working on something, if the if we can have council members up here working on all sorts of ordinances. Please go do your job to get your ordinance passed. Come talk to me and, and see if you can get my support. I'll certainly do the same for the things that I'm writing. But this is your opportunity to have a voice and to decide whether the authors represented the city well or not. Right? This is that voice. And to act like 
democracy was subverted just feels it just feels it not it doesn't feel it is hyperbole it's absurd come on like let's let's vote on this and let's rein in some of this uh, uh, some of these 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 ill feelings that, that that just sort of have bubbled way outside way outside of proportion here it, it has started to, as somebody who has been not an author on any of these ordinances who's been listening who has been frustrated by the process, who has felt like sometimes we're spending too much time on this, as somebody who hears all of those criticisms is valid, you know, it does sometimes feel like people are more concerned with the feelings of two corporations than they are with the substance of the matter, which is, are we enforcing our minimum wage or not? Does the city's minimum wage matter or not? If it's really about rideshare companies having a presence in the city, uh, and we're seeing other rideshare companies start to have a presence, then 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 is it, then then is it about that, or are you in love with two specific companies that provide rideshare services? I mean, I'm 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 really struggling with just how much advocacy has happened on behalf of two companies and two companies only. Because even answers to those questions, solutions to their absence, has been met with just still ire, anger, hyperbole, frustration. I'm really confused by it. And so I think it's completely appropriate for authors of an ordinance to re be responsive to state leaders who said they're going to preempt that ordinance. And if they weren't, I'd, I'd, I'd you know, I would feel like somebody would have to step up because I don't want the state preempting us on anything. That's the League of Cities position. That's our city's position. Was, was the expectation that the authors would just simply stop working on their item? I'm sure we all wish each other would stop working on certain stuff, right? We all have stuff that we don't like that the other people are working on. I have no expectation that my colleagues will stop doing their work simply because I don't like it. Um, do your work, and when it comes up for a vote, I have my opportunity to vote for or against it. That's your voice here. So I'll get off my soapbox. Um, I'm sure others have comments, and um, I, I am excited to hopefully vote on this and then sort of put it to bed uh, next week. All right, thank you. Uh, we are almost wrapping up because uh, we still have one item to go. I'll call Councilmember Wansley and then Councilmember Jenkins. Honestly, Councilmember Ellison said it all. Um, we have from, I had to look in my inbox since March 20th, kept this council abreast of us engaging with state leaders about um, concerns that have been raised either by our state delegation um, or even colleagues here in business interests around getting to alignment around compensation that everyone can support, um, especially amongst the legislative bodies. And so no one was blindsided by us having conversations with the state. Also, in addition to this, I'm glad Council Member Palmasano brought up our legislative agenda because this body voted to support rideshare share policies as part of our legislative agenda. So it would make sense for us, for us to bring our staff and our IGR chair to literally advocate for something that is part of our legislative agenda on the municipal level. As many of us do, as Council Member Ellison highlighted, I know I've seen a number of you all advocate for a number of issues with your respective state leaders because that is part of our job. Our job is doing policy. If you did just want to do social services or serve the police, I encourage you to run for mayor uh, one day, but we are here to do policy and work with respective legislators to deliver on that and to make sure that it's centering the most impacted and most vulnerable folks, which are our residents. And in this case, it's drivers. That council member Chowdhury outlined, predominantly immigrant, predominantly black and brown, and reliant upon public assistance. You know who is not relying on public assistance? Actually, they are welfare, uh, corporate, I'm oh, sorry, public welfare, Uber and Lyft. So to me, that is who's been centered in this work. And I am very proud of the place that we have landed at. 
um, to once again work in tangent with our state leaders to deliver significant and nation leading uh, labor protections that hopefully will encourage other countries to follow suit, sorry, uh, states to follow suit. So I at least wanted to highlight that and also say thank you, Council Member um, Ellison, uh, for sharing a lot of the thoughts that I had to around, this is not about political motives. This is literally delivering a minimum wage for drivers, for workers, as we've done for 70,000 other workers across the city for several years now. All right, Leslie, Council Member Jenkins. Thank you, Chair Osman. I think what is lost in this conversation and what has not been mentioned is the people who rely on rideshare um, for all sorts of um, reasons, be they disabled, um, to get to work, to get home from work. I mean, those are the majority of people that I've been hearing from is people who are relying on rideshare to be able to live their lives. And this ordinance could potentially uh, make that um, less of a possibility for them. I, I recognize that there are two licensed rideshare companies that have entered into the market. I think com um, uh, competition is important. I think it's necessary, and I welcome it. However, to be able to um, get to the point where you are known enough to be able to have to capture the market that Uber and Lyft has, I I think is a really really tall order. Um, and you know, the the riders are going to be the ones who who suffer in this um, in the future. Um, lastly, hopefully, uh, Councilmember Chowdhury. Thank you, Chair Osmond. Uh, I appreciate. I appreciate the dialogue that's been happening up here. I think it's really important for uh, us to have it and the public to be uh, witness to it as they're interacting with us. I'll just note, I was asked by several, several community members to talk to state legislators and work with them in finding a compromise solution. I have multiple emails uh, that indicated that and I took that really serious, seriously um, and I'll just note in our conversations and negotiations with state leaders, um, I, I applaud council members for mentioning that they were representing themselves as council members, that we weren't able to make any decisions. We could make agreements about bringing forward an amendment and doing our work together, but that would have to happen here before the city council um, in the public. And that was something that we consistently raised. I, I also want to mention, um, I believe that our IGR team has been doing incredible work maintaining the rest of our legislative agenda. Uh, I heard today that the 2040 comp plan clarification um, bill was just put into the transportation omnibus in the Senate, which is great for us as the city of Minneapolis, and things are moving along in that front. And our IGR leadership and team have been made aware the entire time as council members were talking to legislators, and they also were really helpful in connecting conversations uh, our council leadership was also made aware and council leadership had consistent meetings with the administration to also make them aware of the conversations that we were having so we could be transparent and move to the process and do our work in order to bring forward a thoughtful amendment before this body for us to consider and if folks do not feel like they could support it and they don't think the compromise is good enough I completely understand I'll understand if you vote no I ask for your support and 
And I'll also note that we have been considering the riders and the passengers that rely on rideshare. They are not a monolith. Many have reached out and said, I do not want to be a, a part of an exploitative system. I want systems that work, and I'm excited that we're expanding the market and there's opportunities for this. I, I, I believe that uh, uh, Senator Omar Fate uh, worked with the Council of Disabilities and the president of the Council of Disabilities actually is a supporter of the legislation at the state legislature. And I've also had multiple residents myself who have either a loved one that relies on rideshare, a senior or someone with a disability that said they're willing to figure out a, another way and are excited to see other things that are available for them because, again, they don't want to be a part of this exploitative service. And so that's kind of what's in tension with, with, with this conversation. Again, two large corporations pitting working people against working people. And I'll just close off by saying um, on uh, May 8th, uh, Forbes reported that Uber Technologies is um, en route to have about $2.4 billion in profit. So that is something that we should center in this conversation. Uh, maybe they're having some troubles with their investors. I'm not going to let that impact how I legislate in terms of how we support working people and upholding a minimum wage in the city of Minneapolis. All right. Uh Thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, move forward. And um, on the motion to amend the proposed guideline, is all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. No. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Next, we will return to the main motion. Is um, I'm not going to ask that. On the motion to approve the amended ordinance, all those in favor say aye. 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 And all those opposed say nay. No. The ayes have it and the motion carries. 